Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here, and I have the honor of having uh, Mr. Ryan Major here. How are you doing? Uh, Miss this is Mrs. That's my fault. <laughs> Mrs. It's been women and men all day. I got caught up. Hey, listen, if I had a dollar for every time someone called me Mr. Ryan Major without, obviously without seeing me, um, I would be a very rich woman. It happens literally all the time, which is why when you see any of my real estate branding, it's hot pink, glitter, sparkles, whatever we can do to try to get the point across. Um, we've just leaned into it. So it's no, all I apologize. That's on me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, but you know what? She likes me enough to, to keep going with the interview guys. I, you know, I, I, I bet, you know, enough social credit, but, uh, you know, what I like to do with my guests is I like to let them tell their story and kind of start where they want to. And then uh, we kind of go from there. Okay. Um, well, I have been a real estate agent since 2015. Got my license in the middle of the year in May. And the goal was to make enough money to show my horses. That's all I wanted to do. I, I, uh, we had moved back to Texas after being away for several years. And I told my husband, like, listen, I want, I want to have horses again. And he said, listen, you're going to have to go back to work. So um, <laughs> I did. And it's, it was wonderful. I started out at a small boutique brokerage here in Lindale, Texas. And um, in that first six months, six months, I think I closed like 15 deals and um, had a great start, went on to be uh, the top producing agent in that brokerage for the next several years. And then in February of 2020, I moved my business to Keller Williams and um, have been there since then underneath your buddy Hayden, the team lead. Uh, he, he helped recruit me over there and we've just, we've had a ball growing the business. I, um, I saw my business explode in 2019 before I made the move. I feel like something shifted inside of me personally and I went from seeing myself as a realtor to seeing myself as a business owner. And I started treating it that way and um, it exploded. So in 2019, I had done 10 and a half million and I sold 52 homes. And then uh, for 2020, when I came over to KW, I remember telling Hayden, I think I want to do like 12 million. And he was like, no, you're going to do 20. And I, I, I was sitting on his couch and I was like, you're crazy um, 20 million is insane. I will die. I think I died at 10 and a half. There's no way I can go to 20. And he's like, well, you're going to, so just deal with it. And basically I, I leaned into everything that KW had to offer. And, uh, in July, I started a team. We started the major team and I brought on two buyer's agents. I also have my assistant, Megan and a transaction coordinator, and at the end of 2020, we closed out the year at 79 transactions and just over 23 million. So oh. we did it. <laughs> so it's interesting, right? We're gonna get into the all the nuts and the bolts of being an agent because I have a lot of agents that I coach. Plus, I just I gravitate a lot towards agents for some reason. But I'm just curious to unpack certain parts of that story. If you, if, if let's just say for whatever reason you didn't go that day and you didn't sit on Hayden's couch and he never had that conversation with you, 12 million is nothing to sneeze at. It's not that you're upset about 12 million, but I'm curious just the psychology behind, he said, no, you're going to do 20. I mean, he didn't do it. You did the work, but I'm just, I'm just curious to unpack when somebody because I've had it happen to me when somebody believes in you, what that does to you. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it was crazy because I, and he and I have talked in a lot of detail about how I feel like when I made the shift to KW and when I came into this different environment, it was almost like someone took the lid off of me. 
Someone mm-hmm. took the, the restraint that maybe I had on myself. Maybe I felt at my other brokerage. I don't know. Um, but it, he gave me permission. He gave me permission to like do the things that he knew I could do. And I think that's really cool. Um, I, I knew that I was going to be, I knew that I was always going to be a top producer, but I didn't know that um, I could do it at that level because I had never seen it done at that level in my old brokerage. Like when I was winning top producer awards there, I was doing it at 6 million, um, five and a half million, stuff like that. So that I was a big fish in a small pond there, but to do 23 million inside the house of KW, Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm, I'm just another $23 million producer. And I'm going to, Stick with me here. Trust me. Okay. There's it's like some some dots. Okay. Uh, a couple questions. Did you did you buy that horse? Did you get did you get the horse you wanted? I now have four horses. Okay, but what's the name of the first horse? Uh, Howie. Okay, Howie. And then how many people work underneath you? How many agents do you have underneath? Uh, two. And they have kids and families or no? Yeah. Okay. So we're talking about one, two, three, six. And you've benefited from the the expansion of your team and the money that you've made for your family. So we have to thank Howie uh, because the 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 what people don't, what I'm trying to put the stepping stones to is the want for something else in our life, meaning like the want for something that we truly want, which is, I mean, I love horses. So the want that you want to have <laughs> those horses and be around them created the impact of many lives over and over again. And I think sometimes we don't put the pieces together in something as magical as, as just wanting a horse. Oh, you, ab- yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. And, and one of my hashtags that we use in social media is hashtag show houses to show horses. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, nobody had ever used it before me. Surprisingly. <laughs> uh, we started you need, using you it. Need, you need your, you, look, I know a guy I know a guy I'll introduce you. You need your own meme and it's you riding in on a horse and it's like to (laughs) to show houses to show horses. Like that's your Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we use it all the time in marketing and, and now, now thanks to my business, I'm a sponsor of a couple different horse organizations. And so that's helped grow the farm and ranch side of my business, which is really cool because that's totally my heart. Um, You know, I do a ton of residential, a ton of new construction because those close faster uh, farm and ranch takes a little bit more time. And so um, when I get to do those big ranch properties, those are those are so fun because the clients are a blast. You get to get out there on the ranger yeah. and you're on 100 acres. And oh, it's I love it. No, I mean, so. see, don't even get me started because I, I, I was just on 20 acres yesterday and then 50 the day before that. And you're just like, this shit's fun. Like, this is fun. Like, I like this. <laughs> so one of my clients, this summer we they bought a hundred acres and then her grandparents bought 20. And um, so we were out, they came down from Colorado, they brought these two rangers, and we were out on this hundred acres all day long. We were so sunburned, we were muddy, but we had so much fun. Like, and then of course that was the acreage they ended up buying. But you it's it's a blast. I love it. Because because it's a lot better on a four-wheeler. No, hundred percent And I think ultimately the aspects of said profession, right? Meaning there's a lot of people that I run into, right? Because the market is flooded with agents that, that are worried or my big concern with agents, just emotional stability is that they hang too much on deal. I mean, well, this deal didn't close that deal didn't close. And it's like, well, yeah, I know, but like you made this relationship with this person. And like, if we look at it on a scale of for the year, it was a great year. Like you didn't look back at January, you know, in December and be like, well, shit that deal in January. Like, and I think that's hard for new agents. Oh my gosh. I, I remember when I was new, I, I held all my deals with really tight, closed hands. <laughs> and, and like the, you know, it's cheesy, but when your hands are clenched, you can't catch the blessing. But when those deals would fall apart, it was, I remember like, I'd be in the kitchen, just like devastated, like, oh my gosh, this deal. And my husband's like, are you mad because your clients aren't getting the house or because you're not getting the commission? Like we need to make sure your heart's in the right place here. And he's, I love my husband so much. He's such a good accountability partner because he will call me on my stuff and I love it. 
And it, and it does, it, it keeps your, it keeps your mind right. When you're, when you're living that way of like, this is not about me. If that deal falls apart, that just means God has something better for that person. And, um, I just think I had one fall apart on Friday and it was super sad for the client, but I mean, I still have them as a client. We're still mm-hmm. going to do real estate together. It just has to be in, in a look a little bit differently. And, mm-hmm. um, like I was, I tell my buyer's agents and I tell new agents all the time when they call me and they ask like real estate's all about peaks and valleys and you're going to be high and you're going to be low. And you might, it might vary by the hour, but the difference is, is when you have more deals going, when your highs are high and your lows are low, you can hop from peak to peak and you don't have to have your whole sure. emotional city relying on your deals. You can just do the business. And so this is where I want to get like, I rarely get this granular on my, on my podcast, but I know it can help so many people. I would say that from what I've seen as I've, as I've helped a lot of young agents, the number one thing that they deal with is they'll have a good month or two, and then it'll be like crickets for like three months. And it's that, like you said, it says massive peaks and valleys. How as an agent, if you're newer or, or, or even if you've been in the game a long time, how do you protect against that? Okay. So you at KW, I hear all the time, you can't just work in your business. You have to work on your business. And, and so for me, like I have support systems in place. I have people here helping me their whole, like Megan, my assistant, her whole job is to help generate the business. Right. So I always fall back on my fundamentals of the things that I do to create my referral based business. Cause I'm like 94% referral based. So Um, when I come in, in the morning, I have a stack of note cards like this that are addressed to my database. And I take time every day ish, almost every day, if I can to send out handwritten notes to my clients. I do those things that I know will generate business, even when I'm busy, because I have to be able to continuously have my deals. So, um, I, I do calls, I do notes, I do pop, by, pop buys. Those are my lead gen activities that I do. And as long as I'm doing those things, um, the business keeps, it keeps coming. And, but it is, I remember I would have, you know, like three or four deals one month and then no deals for a couple months because I'd get too busy. I'd get too wrapped around the axle on repair amendments or negotiating this thing, or I'd spend maybe like an hour stressing out and venting and freaking out about something that really didn't need that much attention. It was, you know, not that big of a deal, but I would waste all this time and energy worrying about this deal instead of handling it, getting what my client needs done, finished, and then moving on to the next thing because I would get all frazzled. Because ultimately what I've realized is that in like when we started out doing Airbnb for clients, like we would take anything. Like I, like I'll Airbnb your dog, you know, your dog house. I don't, you know, but what I've realized is that the the longer you, you go through the process and the more you do and the more properties you look at and the more underwriting you do and so on and so on, it's like, okay, well that might close. If it closes, that's great. I'm going to be very excited about it. But then it's like, it's back to work. And so the attitude of like, like we're not done with one, like you're not going to retire off of one deal. So it's like, ultimately, if you, like if you set yourself up on a yearly plan or, or more like in a legacy play, like wh- where do I want to be in 20, 30 years? Like, you know, what, how many families can I impact in that amount of time that could get their first house and stuff like that. And so I think those are the concepts that, that I think gets lost in like, I was talking to an investor the other day. He's like, he has a ton of properties. And he said, look, one to two to three was super hard. He goes 12 to 60 was easy. And I think, I think as an agent, I think that's the, that's the rub, right? I mean, like, yeah, those first two, three, four, six are like really hard, but you know, I've watched Kayla and I, and you, you've crushed it. And I think, I think you kind of get in a momentum swing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I remember when I, even last year, I would say, or not in 2019, I would think if I have four deals on the board at all times, four under contract, then I'm good. Now, if I have 12 deals on the board at all times, that's my, that's where I like to be. If it's less than that, I have too much extra time on my hands. I don't know what to do with myself. Then I find myself starting to stress about the things that, 
that it's not my job to stress about. It's my job to do the things that recruit the business. That is my job. I don't need to worry about whether or not it's coming in because if I'm doing true to things that I know will generate the business, then it comes. And so that's a huge part of it is just staying focused. And so if you were speaking to a brand new agent or somebody newer to the business, what are those avenues and and things they need to be focused on? Okay. Whether you have a client database or not, you have a sphere of influence. So your job is to make sure that that sphere of influence knows that you're a realtor. (laughs) They have to know that you're a realtor in order to send you referrals. If they don't know, they're not going to call you to list their mom's house. So they have to know that you're a realtor. They have to also know that you care about them, not just their house, not just getting their business. They have to know that you care about them and it should be genuine um, because I love my clients. I love them, my clients, and I tell them I love them, and I show them I love them by bringing them little gifts every month and items of value. We send them mailers. So when I was a new agent, I I was brand new to Lindale. I had lived here for six months when I got my real estate license. I knew one person in this town other, other than my husband, and that was it. I didn't know anybody. And um, so back in the day, I would go and I would go get a dozen donuts. You can buy a dozen donuts for like $3. It's really cheap. You stick your business card on it. And I would go to um, insurance agents offices and I would go to the dry cleaners and I went to the jeweler in town. And I just said, Hey, I'm Ryan major. I'm a new realtor in town and I'd love the opportunity to earn your business. Here's some donuts. And it didn't even matter if they sent me business. It didn't matter. Because it allowed me to feel like I was doing something that was um, going to work. If we are, if we are, in, if we are in pursuit of said thing, and we focus on what we can control, which mm-hmm. is our daily actions, you might not see the business today, but what what do they always say? you know, what's happening for you right now were the decisions that you made six months ago. Mm-hmm. And I think as an agent, especially if you're new or if you're an agent or you've had a great spell and let's say, well, all of a sudden Instagram came out and you're like, I don't, I don't want to do Instagram. I don't want to do Facebook. Like that's an option that, that you can choose to not do that, but you have better have built up your referral base pretty damn good. And what's interesting to me Maybe I just gravitate these people towards me, but I seem to only hang out with agents that base 90% of their business off referrals. Off referrals. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the people that I hang out with that are the best agents I know. And in my opinion, like, listen, I've, I've spent some money on some real estate leads in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't spend very much money on real estate leads right now. I'm a Dave Ramsey endorsed local provider. I buy those leads. Um, But otherwise that's, pretty much it. I would rather make 10,000 phone calls out of a phone book than to have to call some of these internet leads that come in. Because like today I got one and they literally, when they, they went on the website and they asked, please call me and tell me about this house. And instead of giving me their name, they put as dav, zav, zav, like scramble, scramble on the keyboard. And it's like, ah, so for me, I would much rather have you call me and say, hey, Ryan, um, you know, my neighbor, Shelly, she's been thinking about listing her house. Would you mind giving her a call? She's expecting you. I'd rather do that all day long than than try to convert some of the these Internet leads. Um, because for the most part, some of the leads that you get are impressions. They're not really leads. They're just impressions. And at the end of the day, paying for impressions is important but you can't call them leads. Well, I think ultimately I read a book, very, probably not a book, a book that a lot of people have read, but I'm into NLP and it was about creating sales velocity. It was a sales book. And he was saying that like, well, I'll do you one better. My mentor, they flipped like 174 houses a year for a while, like every year. And they went back. Now, granted, I would not suggest this to anybody, but they went back and they, did the numbers on when they closed the deal, 
how they got the deal and so on and so on. And so they ran the numbers and, and that 70% of the deals uh, were on the eighth phone call, but then like 65% of the deals were from referrals from agents. And so it's like, that was kind of the aha moment where like, if it's a referral, they're almost kind of like not for lack of a better word, like half committed, like they're almost in. Right. Because like, I think we, as people, like it, I'll use a restaurant analogy. Like if, if you know somebody and you like them and they're like, dude, you got to go to that place. That barbecue is off the chain. Everybody's like, Oh, hell yeah. Well, did you look at the reviews? No, no, no. Billy said it's cool. And so yeah. I feel like you almost like have your client sold on who you are because they vouch for you. It's all about building trust, right? And if someone they trust has referred them to you, then that's that's the hardest thing that we have to overcome as agents is getting them to trust you. Um, I had a client yesterday tell me, he goes, I just want your opinion on this because we're paying you a lot of money and we trust your opinion. And I was like, you are paying me a lot of money and I'm so thankful for that. And this is what I would do. And I, and I told him, I said, if this was my house, this is what I would do. And I meant it. This is exactly. I mean, he he doesn't do this every day. He was relying heavily on me. Mm-hmm. And um, where did he come from? Oh, I sold his neighbor's house. So he he saw me take care of her through that transaction. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. he called her and said, "Hey, I want that girl's number." And then he called me. And I mean he interviewed a couple other agents. He still ended up going with me and we sold his house in 24 hours during the snowstorm. So I'm not mad about it. It was a good day. No. And and, (laughs) and something, something I want to unpack for you. And where, where did you live before you lived in Lindell? Okay. So I grew up in Fredericksburg, Texas. Okay. Um, We, my husband and I both graduated from Texas state and San Marcos. So very familiar with down there where y'all are all at. Sure. And um, then he took a job at Quantico. And so we lived um, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, just outside of Quantico for a while, for four years. And um, then he took a job transfer to Tyler to get us back to Texas. So he works in Tyler um, for the federal government. And uh, we found a house in Lindell and that's how we landed here. So what I find fascinating, right. And, and, you know, I'm on a a lot of, social media calls or, you know, I have friends that invest everywhere. There's a lot of people talking about Austin. There's a lot of people talking about, I mean, Chicago, you know, wherever Chicago, the hot market, Denver, but I have friends cause he's my friend Hayden. And I know what you've done. And I think I, what I'm trying to drive at this is I wish people would understand that you can make a damn good living and you don't have to be in these major metropolitans with the way that the, the climate is changing and the way that people, the accessibility with technology and, and, and like where we're having a conversation right now. And I'd love to hear your opinions on, on stuff like that and, and how I've watched Kayla just crush it. And, and, you know, they left Austin, right. And they're just happy as ever. Mm-hmm. And and I would just love to hear your opinion on on how you view that for like a new agent that feels like they need to like get in that, you know, Austin grind, which is, to be honest with you, is a nightmare right now. I mean, I feel like in this market that we're in, I think I asked Hayden the other day, I can't remember. I think he said there's like 1600 agents in our area, in our MLS membership. Uh, I don't know if that's right or not. Um, but, you know, there's 100,000 people that live in Tyler. There's 5,000 people, 6,000 ish that live in Lindale. So, I mean, it would take a lot for us to get the population numbers through, you know, uh, Kyle, Austin, Round Rock, like, and on up 35. So, for me to be a stellar agent and to stand out among 1,600, right? It's a numbers game. There's yeah. not 52,000 agents that I'm competing with. And, yeah. And when you have 80% of them being part-time agents anyway, or, or just playing at it, when you take it seriously as a job, it's very easy to rise to the job. Um, No, you go ahead. Well, and not only that, but like you said, you can telework from anywhere. You've got high speed internet. And more importantly on the psychology of this, because I went from Sugarland, Texas to Beaumont, Finette, Texas, when I was 17. 
this is about to get on some deep. You need to share this with your country peeps, all right? Because I understand, <laughs> I understand both people very well. I can wear cowboy boots or I can wear a suit. So that's one of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me through the divorce was I can operate in both settings. Plus, yeah. I like both. The the small, let's just say, smaller town country living person is more adept to live a life based off of relationships and referrals opposed to a city transaction, which is looking for the best number or it's highly competitive. And so ultimately, if you pair your amazing personality and your go and your, and your, and your drive with the amazing people that want to see you succeed, which is, that's what they want to do. You have a perfect storm slash people are leaving the coast and Austin's too expensive. So it's like, if you look at it from a physiological stand back micro level, it's a perfect storm for your abilities, really. Oh, and it's been fantastic. Like I've got right now, I've got a deal going in Plano um, and then I'll, t- I'll take their, their buying and then we'll list their house as well. And so I'm, I was flirting with the idea of like major team Dallas, right? And then I'm like, Oh, it's kind of far. <laughs> like, I don't really like driving on the highway and I don't know, like, because it's so great here. And like you said, the cost of living. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh. Like, well, That's why we're, that's why I'm trying to move out of the country uh, in the next two, three years, because I thought to myself, like, I live in Georgetown and it's great. Don't get me wrong, but I'm still paying like, 1300 bucks. And I was like, so let me get this straight. I can move to like Colombia or like Cartagena or like I can move to the Greek Isles and pay like 750 for like a penthouse and still make American money by my laptop. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that because like it's like I almost like tripled my income without doing anything and it's not asking any more out of my life. And so that's what I'm trying to get apart with this conversation is that, yes, you could move to Plano. But then that's going to be marketing. That's going to be this. And it's going to be taking time away from your lifestyle. And I prescribe to the, uh, my buddy wrote a great book, Lifestyle Investor. And so if you keep your costs lower, you can live better. And you're not like, if you wanted to, right, you have goals. But if you really wanted to, you could totally turn it off for a couple of weeks. What, my business? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't. But I'm saying if there was, if you really wanted to, if you got to a point where you said like, (laughs) oh, I'm done. We're going to go down to Mexico for three weeks. And then you're going to be like, okay, well, I'm going to say my buyer's agents. Now, if you were, if that same scenario where you just launched a business in Plano, you couldn't do that. And yeah. so people got to be careful how they scale. Did, did you see the anxiety like rush over my face? When you <laughs> Dude, I, I, I literally, <laughs> I literally found out in two moments how much you love working. <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with working and it like, so I have a coach through KW and her whole, her whole, she's going to listen to this and she's going to die. She's going to be like, oh my God, Ryan. Like she is like telling me all the time to take time off, take time yes. off, be with your family, take time off. Be with your family. Okay. So, okay. A little session for your coach. So, <laughs> uh, so the question is, is a little bit of twofold. One, I think you are an entrepreneur that's, that reads the tea leaves and sees that you have an opportunity in a short window where the explosion rate of your area and the new construction, which is an easy product to sell because it's made, it's made well and it's easy and the, the, the buying terms are easier than the, you know, whatever. And so you're thinking to yourself, if I had to open, if I had to guess, if I go hard, like really hard for like the next four to five years, like I'm going to set myself up where I can really make any decision I want moving forward. Is that, am I correct? Yeah. I mean, I definitely am, am trying to abide by the MREA model and become the millionaire real estate agent and be able to eventually phase myself to where my team is Mm -hmm. self-sustaining. And so that's, that's the goal. The goal is when, when I'm, you know, done, when I'm ready to relax, well, really, my goal is when I retire um, to go hard with the horses and 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 yes. try to show all the time. Because right now I escape for around one week in a month. I just got back yesterday mm-hmm. from a show. And um, so 
but to be able to go full time and manage, if I needed to manage parts of my real estate business, I could still do it. Like you said, from my laptop, from anywhere. Um, but without having to be at a kitchen table every day. Um, but I do love it. I love it so much. And my husband, he's always talking about if we ever won the lottery, um, he would definitely retire. But the other day he's like, what does he, what does he do now? Uh, he's an intelligence analyst for the uh, federal government. So yes, I want to meet this man and I want to ride a horse. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But wait, here's the deal. I finally told now I told Kayla, I will come now, now that you bought the 2.5 acres with the pond. I, it's, I'm so excited for them. Oh my gosh. It's no, be- no, I got, we, me and Kayla be talking about tiny homes in the area <laughs> and doing some Airbnb, all kinds of stuff. But what's interesting, right? And this is where I want to go with the, with this conversation, because I think this is the hardest thing. And it's the hard, I can't answer this question because I'm not an agent, but I want, I want to hear your view on it. There are many different types of brokers, right? And I think this big concern for a new agent is, you know, what type of broker am I looking for? So on and so on. Here's the kicker. There's a lot of brokers that that are great. I mean, they're really good at what they do. They make money, but they're investor brokers. And when they're investor brokers, they're very busy. And so you as a new agent are not going to get what you need out of that. Okay, wait for it. Then there's another broker who's a high performing broker. Not an investor, but still high performing, can't give you what you need either. And then there's the brokers that have transitioned in their career into more of a, I'm cultivating my my team broker. But those those are the three that I see. Am I missing anyone? Well, the hang your shingle here and you'll never see me again, broker. So there's a fourth. Okay. (laughs) And and my question to you is, my question to you as a brand new agent, it's, it's, it's tempting to gravitate towards the investor broker because that's where you want to get. Mm-hmm. But my question to all the new agents is, what if you went all in on yourself for two years and focused on the capital that you could make as an agent? And then you had enough capital, wait for it, to make an investment from a position of strength instead of hoping. And I think that's where everybody gets it twisted. They haven't maximized out their career, but they want to get to the investing instead of looking at it on a long-term gain. It drives me crazy. I mean, like, listen, if you want to be a wolf, you've got to train with the wolves. And so you need to go where you can be surrounded by people who are having high level conversations. So find that brokerage where you can walk into someone's office and say, hey, uh, I want to do 12 million this year. And they say, "Uh, no, you're going to do 20. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to help you do it. And I'm going to show you how to do it. Like, like, I think that's, that's, it's so important. Like I had an agent in my office. She came out from grapevine to hang out with me on Thursday and we took a KW class together. And she, she literally just wanted to come and sit in my office and learn from me for the day. And I just told her, I said, there's no reason you can't do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You just have to put in the work and I, I think the the theme of of all of it is just come in and go to work and surround yourself with people who are fired up and excited and passionate about what they're doing so that when you're ready to take the next step, whether it's to investing or to open your own brokerage or to start a team or whatever, like you know what it takes to lead people because you've been led by people who are passionate. And ultimately, I think why people get and I'm just using myself as an example. I think why people get so fired up by me is because I have an internal passion for life. And, and, and what I mean by that is, is, is I'm excited about horses. I'm excited about tiny homes. I'm excited about coming out to Tyler and speaking to all the agents. And I don't drink anymore, but y'all can drink and I'll have a sparkling water. But like, But what I'm saying is like, I'm just excited because where I'm not okay with, and, I, and I'm not as I'm not getting on my soapbox, but what I'm not okay with is in Austin, Texas, or a Dallas, or a Houston, or a whatever, is getting all the publicity when there are amazing humans mm-hmm. doing great jobs, to be honest with you, probably better careers in a, in a town like Tyler and Lydow or, or Spinette, Texas, or, or you know whatever small town. And they don't need the publicity, but 
but saying that they're not like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, how that game in the real estate space, it's like everybody's doing the same thing. There's wolves everywhere. So find your, basically the theme is find your pack and, and then get to fucking work. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, you know, like, and, and don't be, don't be a condescending turd. Like if you are a big city agent, like, please don't be a condescending turd. Can we just say that out loud to everyone? Hey, because I set you up for that. I didn't know that you. It makes me, <laughs> no, no, I'm going to get fired up and mad. It makes me. So I, hey, I felt <laughs> like I had you there and I was going to like <laughs> tee it up. Yeah. No, like it's so frustrating because like these agents will come out from the city and they just automatically assume they've done more deals than me. And yeah. so they call me and they're like, nur, 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 on the phone. And I'm like, what? Why do you got to be like that? Why can't you just be nice? I know how to negotiate a hot water heater. I've been to Lowe's. I know how much they cost. I'm not worried about that. Like, would you please quit it? Like, oh my gosh. So then I'm me. So then I have to pull numbers and I'm a member of the Dallas MLS. So hi, um, guys, I can see your numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. So they did not sell 79 houses last year. Yeah. But I did. So, okay. Uh, and, and, and talk about, cause I know him. And I, you know, he trained me, but in the different sector in the restaurant business. Um, and I owe a lot to him. When you have somebody in an elevated position, whether he's your boss or your coworker, who can see parts of yourself that maybe you don't believe in yourself, like talk about what it is like to have, you know, your real estate coach, your, your you know, all the, your regular coaches, like just, what does that do for somebody? I, I, my big concern is that enough people don't invest in these avenues that, you know, they're quick to go buy a new car, or a new thing. And it's like, if you invest in yourself and, and you surround yourself with the right coaches, you know, you, that car, you could buy 10 of those cars. Yeah. Well, so I'm a personal development junkie. Like I love, I love it. Um, you would crack up if you saw my nightstand, there's like books like this. <laughs> uh, now I have to read those, which is the issue, but um so I already had that in me. I already had the desire to make myself better. And when I make myself better, it makes my business better. Um, but having Hayden, who I just uh, adore him and our personalities are so similar and we think the same and we're both crazy in the same way of like, when we're on something, we're 150,000% on it. And when we're off, like, don't mention that to me again, I'm off. Like that's, we are, so when I met him and we were sitting at his kitchen table and we were talking about me coming over and stuff, like I was so, I was like drawn to him because I'm like, our energy will play so well off of each other and we'll fire each other up. And that's exactly what we do. Um, So that's wonderful. That's amazing. Like I couldn't, I I couldn't imagine not having him in my corner. Um, And then just having my real estate coach who, I've only been with her since October, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, So just for a few months, but she speaks life into me and she is not afraid to like stomp on my toes and be like, but she does it in such a way that I'm like, you know, you know what I do? I shouldn't let my secrets out because I would do the (laughs) same thing with you if I coached you because I have a photographic memory so what I do is I hold on to words or like phrases that you say, and I hold on to it for like three weeks. And then when you crack the door open in that moment, I drop your own words on you. And then you go, who the fuck said that? And I go, you said it. And they're like, oh, damn. Like, that's like the, the tricks, because here's the scary thing about you. And I can feel this, like having a conversation with you. If you want something, you're a bull in a china shop. Like you're going to like, they, they don't, they don't call me the rhino for nothing. That's my nickname. Like, and that's when, when you said, when I'm off of something, I'm fucking off of it and don't talk to me about it. I'm the same way when I'm done. Now here's the deal. It could be putting the trash bag on the trash bag. It could be, it could be (laughs) sweeping the floor, but I'm, when I'm in it, I'm in it. Like I'm in it and like all in and like you get me going. I'm telling you right now, I jumped in a 50, 42 year old man's arms yesterday and bear hugged him in a, in a grown man's arms. And we're, I'm negotiating the deal right now as we're talking. It's the biggest deal of my life. And I don't even want to tell you what just happened because you would get so upset. The wholesaler 
had the property priced wrong on the flyer by like 300K. Good or bad? Bad. It had to be bad. 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 And there's a, there's a group flying in from California to look at it and tomorrow. Oh, my God. So, but here's the deal. <laughs> here's the deal. We got the wholesaler to eat it. He's taking the eat. Yeah. <laughs> that really sucks for him. <laughs> hey, bro, you better watch your numbers. Yeah. I mean, a couple, 1.3, 1.5 is a big difference. There is a very big difference in that. Oh, my God. That's crazy. I love yeah. it. So ultimately, you have to ask yourself, right, if you know that about yourself, this is the key, and this is what's changed my life, is surround yourself with people that have no problem calling you out on your shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I wish my assistant was still here. She just left. She is number one at that. Yeah. <laughs> she the best. Um, so Hayden sent me a spreadsheet today because I have to turn in my profit and loss to him before. Oh, uh, and you don't want to do anything with that. No. Oh my God. I called him and I was like, uh, can you fix this? I can't do it. And so then he's like, he, anyway, it was a mess. And, um, so one of the formulas was wrong and it had our production for January. It was off by like 500,000. And I told Megan, I was like, these numbers look wrong. It says, you know, we're not going to hit a million for the month. And she was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's weird. We only had that one deal fall out. I didn't, I thought we were way over it. And she was like, oh my God, we're going to have so much to make up. It's only, you know, it's only January. We're going to have to make all this up. And it was so funny. Cause she just, she's like, I mean, we're, you're just gonna, we're gonna have to figure this out. And yeah. so then I looked at her a minute later and I was like, um, the formula was wrong. It had four of them left off. We're fine. And she, she was like, Oh, good. Now you only have to make up a million. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's no, 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 but like, but like, but like, I get this all the time and I've got the Airbnb business and I've got, we got another business, you know, more businesses coming and, and everything. I, like a year ago, I was kind of like trying to do everything. Like that was me. Like, ah, I got this, I got, I can build this and I get, and what I realized, cause I had to lose a lot of money and I had to go to Costa Rica for 10 days uh, to kind of recharge and, and realize what I did that I do a couple things well. And I have a vision I can paint and I'm a damn good cheerleader. But one of the things I'm really good at is I spot talent and I can put them in the right positions. And so if those are the things that I do, then we are humming. Mm -hmm. The moment you ask me to put things in a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet is the moment that the business is about to go under. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's why having the proper leverage is so important. Like I, and I didn't, I knew nothing about leverage before I came to KW. When mm -hmm. I did 10 and a half million in 2019, I did it with, this girl. Oh my God. Ooh. There was no Megan. There was no Angela. There was, it was me, myself and Irene trying to get our con. I mean, don't, I would hate to even look at those contracts because, <laughs> and I was at a brokerage that didn't have compliance. So there, there was nobody, what I'm getting at is there was nobody holding me accountable. There was nobody checking me. Um, and as much as I hate that they hold me accountable sometimes or when Angela says, Hey, you missed this on this document, please tell mm -hmm. your client to whatever. And I'm just like, um, but I'm so thankful because that means my clients are getting proper representation and I'm probably not going to get sued. Um, which is, which is great. But having, having those people in my life that I'm not great at creating graphics, but Megan is. So she just, that's what she does. And I'm able to do the things that I'm good at, which is relationship building and making people feel comfortable and selling. That's what, that's my jam. So I'll go do that. She can stay in the office and help me generate the business by doing all the graphic design and all the stuff that I don't like doing. For sure. And so I just had an idea. We'll talk about it offline. Uh, Cause I think it's going to be awesome. Um, but I could go, I could talk to you for 20 hours. The, the, <laughs> here's, the, here's the problem. 
when me, you, and Hayden and Kayla get sitting around a fire listening to some music, it's going to get real fun real quick. I'm so excited. I can't wait. Are you coming tomorrow? I have a really good fire pit. <laughs> okay. And I also yeah. don't drink. So we can, and, and Hayden's flirting with the idea of not drinking. So we can he should all probably, just, He you know, should do that. <laughs> he should do that. <laughs> uh, we can sit around and drink Topo Lime and make s'mores. And dude, and let me tell you something. I slam some Topos. Don't even know. I get weird on some Topos. Hang on. Let me show you something. Do you see my, my mini fridge? Yeah, it's all Topos. It, yeah, and it has a bottle opener built into it, so I can open it. I them. love it. I got to get in one. <laughs> so if people want to find out more about you, they want to find out what you do, how do they do that? So you can follow me on Instagram. It's uh, the major team at KW. Or on Facebook, it's uh, Ryan Major, Realtor. Or I don't know. I think it's <laughs> Megan. I'm looking at Megan's desk. She's not here. It, it's Ryan Major, the major team at KW on Facebook. Or you can give me a call. Um, my phone number is 903-258-1317. Um, I'd be happy to to help if anybody has questions or wants to sell their house. I love it. Guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.